For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 4A. In this video, we're going to use the results found in the previous chapter to find the Sun's binding energy. We'll first come up with an equation of state for the material in the Sun, and then we'll calculate the binding energy assuming Newtonian gravity. The calculations in this video will heavily depend on the physics found in the previous two chapters, so it would be advisable to be familiar with those two chapters before watching this video. I rated the physics level in this video as intermediate. So let's first figure out the equation of state of the material in the Sun. In Stellar Physics 3b, we found a relationship between the mass of a star and the fractional gas pressure, which I've called beta, which is just the gas pressure divided by the total pressure. And if we plug in one solar mass into this, we'll find that beta is very close to 1. So we're just going to take beta to be 1. Beta equals 1 means all the pressure is gas pressure. And for such a system, if you have a monatomic gas, the adiabatic index is 5 thirds. We derive this in Stellar Physics 2c. The thermodynamics in this video were all derived in Stellar Physics 2a through c, so I'm going to take them as given. Since we have a gas dominated equation of state, this means that the pressure supporting the star against gravity is all gas pressure, as opposed to radiation pressure, we can take the material in the Sun to be a Maxwell Boltzmann gas. For a Maxwell Boltzmann gas, we have that the thermodynamic potential has the following form, where eta tilde is the kinetic degeneracy parameter. So it's the chemical potential, which is phi, minus the mass divided by the temperature. This is why it's called the kinetic degeneracy parameter, because we've subtracted off the mass. From this, we can find the particle number density. The particle number density will be proportional to the mass density, and I can invert this equation to solve for eta tilde. So eta tilde will be some constant, which I've called A, plus the log of the density divided by the temperature to the 3 halves. So how did I get this? So first I replaced the particle number density with the mass density, rho, and then I divided both sides of the equation by this giant fraction here, and took the log to isolate eta tilde. So A here will be the log of all these constants times whatever constant multiplies the particle number density in order to get the mass density. We don't really care what it is. It's just to show the form of eta tilde. From the thermodynamic potential, we can also find the entropy. But you have to be careful here because eta is temperature dependent. So when I take the derivative with respect to T of the thermodynamic potential, I've got a T here, and I've got a T in here as well. So this T will account for this term, and then the derivative of eta tilde will account for this term. Now this is the total entropy for a given volume with capital N number of particles. If I divide by the number of baryons, I will get the entropy per baryon. And here I've replaced eta tilde with the eta tilde we found over here. So the entropy per baryon will be some constant, which I've called S naught, plus this log. Now this is the entropy per baryon for one particle species. So if you have multiple particle species, like say you have protons and electrons, to get the total entropy, you have to add the entropy for each particle. And a star is predominantly made up of helium and hydrogen, so you'll have the electrons plus the protons, plus the alpha particles, and in the sun there's even some heavier elements at very small percentage. The effect of this is that you'll have multiple of these s naughts in here, so we can just call s naught one big constant, and then this ln term will be multiplied by the number of particle species. So the total entropy will be some constant plus this log term multiplied by the number of particle species in the material. We can also find the pressure, which for a Maxwell-Boltzmann gas will just be the normal ideal gas law. And the total energy will be 3 halves nkt. For an adiabatic process, the pressure, which is a function of density and entropy, will equal some function of entropy times rho raised to the adiabatic index. In order to find what k of s is, I can solve this equation for the temperature and then plug that into the pressure which will give that K of S is proportional to E raised to some number times the entropy. And it turns out, if you want to figure it out, that this number alpha is two thirds divided by the number of particle species. For the purposes of this video, it doesn't really matter. We're just trying to get the general form of K of S. 
When you do this, you'll also find that gamma 1 has to be 5 thirds, which agrees with what we said a minute ago. So that's a good sanity check. Now, I'm going to remind you again what gamma 1 is. It's the adiabatic index, and it's related to how the pressure changes with density, assuming constant entropy, meaning with no heat flow. Now, P equals K times rho raised to some exponent is a polytrope relation. So we can write gamma 1 as being 1 plus 1 over some number, which I'm calling N1, which is the polytrope index. Now, don't confuse this with what I called the polytrope index in Stellar Physics 3b, which I said was related to gamma, which is not gamma 1. The difference between gamma and gamma 1 is that gamma does not assume no heat flow. Gamma is a total derivative of P with respect to rho. And here, be careful, N is the polytrope index. It's not the number density N here. So this is just some number, which we found in Stellar Physics 3b is 3 for stars. Gamma 1 depends on the exact equation of state. For a monatomic Maxwell-Boltzmann gas, we know that gamma 1 is 5 thirds, which means N1 is 3 halves. Okay, now that we have an equation of state, we can go ahead and find the binding energy of the sun. The binding energy, remember, is just the internal energy plus the gravitational potential energy. And we've already derived in chapter 3 that the general form of the internal energy per unit mass is P over rho divided by gamma 1 minus 1. If gamma 1 is constant, we can pull it out of the internal energy integral and just integrate P over rho over the mass. Gamma 1 is 5 thirds, so this factor out in front of the integral will be 3 halves. And P over rho dm can be written in multiple ways. To calculate this integral, I'm going to use this form, 3 halves integral of PdV which I can start off by integrating by parts. And the first term here on the boundaries goes to zero because the pressure at the surface is zero and the volume at the center of the star is zero. So I'm left with negative three halves times this integral. In Stellar Physics 3a, we found the equation for hydrostatic equilibrium, which told us what dpdr is. So I can now substitute that in. And now I'm going to use the fact that rho is dmdv by definition and substitute that in for the density. And I've also divided and multiplied by dv. So here I have dr divided by dv and then times dv. The top dv will cancel with one of the bottom dvs. And dv dr for a sphere is just the surface area of the sphere. It's 4 pi r squared. The volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So plugging this in and simplifying, I get the final form for the internal energy. But this is just one half times the negative of the gravitational potential energy. So we found that the internal energy is negative one half the gravitational potential energy. This is the virial theorem. I mentioned the virial theorem in the first video of the series, Stellar Physics 1a. I didn't derive it. Now while this is not a formal derivation of the virial theorem, we've at least shown that it does hold for a monatomic Maxwell-Boltzmann gas in a gravitational field. Since the internal energy is negative one-half the gravitational energy, then the total energy will be half of the gravitational energy. The gravitational energy is this integral right here. It's just taken from Newton's law of gravitation. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to see if you can show that this integral for an n degree polytrope is equal to 3 divided by 5 minus n times gm squared over r, where n is the polytrope index, m is the total mass of the star, and r is the radius of the star. Showing this requires you to be a little bit clever, but I'll give you a hint. Use the polytrope relations we found in Stellar Physics 3b. Now, here, this gamma is just some general gamma. It doesn't have to be the gamma associated to n equals 3. It could be gamma 1. It could be anything. This is just a mathematical result. Now, in the last chapter, we assumed adiabatic processes. So let's do that and see what the binding energy is in this case. For an adiabatic process, we have that P equals K of S times rho to the gamma 1. We can plug that in to our internal energy. And if the entropy and gamma 1 are constant in the star, we can pull both k and gamma 1 out of the integral. In this case, I'll leave it as another exercise. See if you can show that for an n-degree polytrope in hydrostatic equilibrium, the internal energy 
has the following result. Now here I've labeled N1 to specify that this is the adiabatic index. And so N1 is the polytrope index associated to the adiabatic index gamma 1, which in our case, we already know is 3 halves. So gamma 1 is 5 thirds. And if N1 equals 3 halves, you can plug that in and you'll get back the virial theorem. So now we get that for a general adiabatic process, the total energy will be proportional to gamma 1 minus 4 thirds. Now we already found this in Stellar Physics 3E, so we're just confirming our result here. In order to get this, I just added the internal energy to the gravitational energy, which had a similar form, it's just that we had a 3 here instead of N1. And then I substituted N1 with gamma 1 using this relationship. If gamma 1 equals 5 thirds, then the total binding energy will be negative 3 sevenths times gm squared over r. So this is true if the adiabatic assumption holds. If you're finding this video interesting so far, be sure to like and subscribe, and maybe share it with a few friends. So we have the binding energy for adiabatic processes in a gas-dominated star, but does the adiabatic assumption hold for the sun? Well, recall what we derived the entropy to be. For this adiabatic result, we needed k of s to be constant, which means we need t to the 3 halves divided by rho to be constant throughout the star. Well, actually, this doesn't really hold for the sun. It turns out that the sun is made up of a core, which is where nuclear fusion takes place, then a large radiative zone, and then the outer layers of the sun are convective zones. Now, don't get confused here, because earlier I said that the sun is a gas-dominated star rather than a radiation-dominated star. This does not correspond to a radiative zone. When I said the star was gas-dominated versus radiation-dominated, I meant that the pressure support against gravity was predominantly gas pressure rather than radiation pressure. Here, when I say that we have a radiative zone, and by the way, the core is also a radiative zone, but we separate it because that's where nuclear fusion takes place, I mean that the dominant form of heat transport is radiation rather than convection or conduction. So this can be a bit confusing here because radiation-dominated stars are generally fully convective, and gas-dominated stars often have large radiation zones. Now, remember what we're asking is, can we assume the entropy is constant throughout the star? Well, the entropy is only constant in the convective zones. This is because convective zones, on the one hand, mix everything up, and convective instability will kick in when entropy decreases with radius, or better, it no longer increases with radius. Radiation-dominated stars, in the sense of pressure support, do have constant entropy, and that is why they're fully convective. But in the case of the sun, entropy is not constant throughout the sun, and so the adiabatic equation of state does not hold. So that means we have to calculate the binding energy for a non-adiabatic equation of state, so we'll take gamma instead of gamma 1, meaning we'll allow for heat flow. Gamma, for all stars, is 4 thirds. We found this in Stellar Physics 3b. Recall that for a general polytrope profile, the gravitational energy has the following form. If gamma equals 4 thirds, then n equals 3, so that gives us the factor out front to be 3 halves. Now we've already shown that the virial theorem holds for any equation of state, as long as you have a monatomic Maxwell-Boltzmann gas, so the total energy of the sun will be 3 fourths gm squared over r. When we assume the adiabatic equation of state, it was 3 sevenths instead of 3 fourths, so the difference isn't that significant. In fact, even if you assumed constant density, which corresponds to n equals zero, in that case the energy would be 3 tenths, so between 3 fourths, 3 sevenths, 3 tenths, you're within about a factor of two either way. So it really doesn't make that big of a difference. In this case, it turns out that the total energy is about one millionth the rest mass of the sun. This is about 15 million years worth of the energy output of the sun. So we can safely say the sun is unlikely to explode anytime soon, because in order to do so, you'd have to dump in 15 million years worth of energy generated by the sun. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe. In the next video, I'm going to calculate the theoretical maximum mass of a star. In Stellar Physics 1a, the first video in this series, I gave you what that mass was, but told you that we didn't have enough physics under a belt to actually derive it.
Well now we do have the physics required to do so, and if you'd like to see this derivation, hit the bell and subscribe to be notified when this video comes out.